started with something as small, or not quite as small as this, but something like that, the GPS thing. Well, today I know exactly what, how, and how this thing happened. So uh, I'll see how this started or ushered in the GPS thing. Actually, this is part of the revolutions, talk about the revolutions, in science and technology paradigms. Gone are the days when you say to my new friend, I lost my way, sorry, I'm late. You say, why didn't you Google it or um, MapQuest or GPS? Sir. You are late because there is no GPS with you. That's right. <laughs> and I will get from this outstanding man. GPS. <laughs> Well, our life is revolutionized because of science and technology. And those of you who are students in science and technology, or uh, <coughs> teaching it, or living around it, are lucky because you are nearer to the oven, if you like, to smell the smells and see the hot, hot stuff as it comes. But guess what? All the 7 billion plus people in the population of the world are touched. Their lives are touched and really changed by science and technology. So I don't know who am I talking to, Sir Isaac Newton of the future, or uh, maybe Albert Einstein, one of you. I don't know. But I hope that some of you someday will do another revolution. And uh, Dr. Stephen Daniels and myself wish that this wouldn't be the first and the last symposium about science and technology. We really look forward to the second and third. And in your lifetime, we'll do the 50th. And you remember that we started it in 2013. Now, uh, I'll ask Dr. Stephen Daniels to give us a word and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Watt. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. And uh, we, I'm very excited to be part of this whole project. Uh, it was a uh, long, long time ago. Uh, Dr. Wabi and I got together and thought about what we might do and that uh, maybe something about uh, technology and, and how things change the world was kind of the idea. And even in its embryonic state, I ended up talking to, uh, uh, to Barry and uh, he actually had this idea for this talk and it was so much in line with what we did, it helped to shape the entire symposium. So I want to thank him for that, and I want to introduce him of the EIU Geology Geography Department. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Steve. I want to thank uh, Dr. Wabi and, and Dr. Daniels for organizing the symposium. And uh, yeah, I remember when uh, Dr. Daniels was talking to me about it, and I thought, oh, we have to talk about longitude. And I opened my big mouth and I said that, and <laughs> here I am today. Um, as I explored the, the problem of longitude, which is inherently a geographical problem, I, I came to realize that the solution was inherently a physics solution. And we have some physicists here today, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> if you guys see anything wrong with what I, what I say, please feel free to interject or correct me. Uh, or if anybody has any questions, um, uh, please feel free to interject. I remember when I first learned geography. We all know the Earth is round. But I remember the first time I learned that the sun doesn't set in the east. And, uh, of course it doesn't set in the east. Doesn't rise in the east and doesn't set in the west. At least not exactly. Uh, in the summer, the sun rises a little north of east and sets a little north of west. And in the winter, it rises a little south of east and sets a little south of west. And that just floored me, because my whole life I thought the sun rose in the east. Uh, in order to figure it out why it wasn't exactly east and west, and how much different it was, I actually got out a little ping pong ball and drew lines on it, representing the equator and my location and the site to the sun and all that. And I realized at that point that spherical geometry is not what we think. It's confusing. It has these little quirks to it. Uh, and one of those quirks that's affected world history is that with the, the spherical geometry and with the motion of the planet, 
For most of human history, people have been unable to determine their longitude. Uh, now, today we take for granted that we can, no matter where we are, immediately determine our location, consisting of our latitude north or south of the equator, our longitude east or west of the Greenwich Meridian. Uh, for example, we are at 39 and approximately 39 and a half degrees north latitude, approximately 88 and one sixth degrees west longitude. And if you didn't know that, you could go to any one of uh, the web tools that's online where you can uh, view an aerial photograph, pinpoint your location, and it will tell you uh, your latitude and longitude. But for most of human history, the quirk of spherical geometry is that people knew their latitude, but not their longitude. It was as if the Earth was made up not of a graticule, not of crisscrossing lines, parallels, and meridians, but it's as if we only had the parallels. We didn't have any meridians to go on. We knew where we were this way. We wish knew which one of these parallels we were on, but we didn't know where we were east and west. Um, you see, everything is lined up to tell us our latitude. Old sailors knew finding your latitude was really easy. There were so many things that pointed the way. Uh, you could, the easiest way was to look at the North Star. Uh, if you can locate the North Star above the horizon, and if you find a device that allows you to measure how far above the horizon that North Star is, that angle in degrees is precisely your latitude. The reason that works is because the Earth's motion, latitude derives naturally from it. Uh, latitude indicates your position with respect to the equator, with respect to the north and south poles. And these are the natural marking points um, of the Earth's rotation. So latitude tells you where you are with respect to these natural locations. With longitude, The problem with longitude is that there is no natural reference point. Everything in the sky is spinning around in a giant circle. And to know your longitude, you have to know where you are on that circle at a given point in time. But the circle looks exactly the same in different places on the Earth. Let's pick a random star. We look at that star, we see exactly where it is in the sky. Well, the same star will be in the same place in the sky um, in London about five or six hours earlier. It will be in the same place in the sky in Los Angeles two hours later. Uh, the entire sky moves around in a circle. Uh, and so longitude is equivalent to time. And the problem has always been to solve the longitude, you need to solve the problem of time. That's a difficult problem to solve. It's a difficult problem to keep track of time. And for a long time, we didn't really have a way to do it. And it's, this makes for a strange world. How do you get around in a world where you don't know your longitude? Um, so, some clues come from the Viking navigation. Uh, the Vikings explored uh, Iceland and Greenland and even made it to the east coast of North America, uh, starting sometime around 980 AD. Uh, and they established a permanent colony on the west coast of Greenland. And they traded back and forth from their home base in Norway with Greenland. And so one wonders, how did they get back and forth between these two locations if they couldn't tell their position on the sea? Uh, the answer was called running down the parallel, running down that line of latitude. And the ancient Norse, doc Norse documents explain, if you start 
from someplace near modern Bergen on the west coast of Norway and just keep the same latitude and travel west. Just keep going until you hit Greenland. And then make a left turn and follow the coast. And that was the instructions. That's all you knew. You didn't know how long it would take. You, you didn't know whether you were halfway there, or three quarters of the way there, or only one tenth of the way there, but you knew if you followed the latitude, if you ran down the parallel, you would eventually go get to your destination. But not knowing the longitude had consequences. One of the most famous such consequences um, is that Christopher Columbus didn't know how far he had to go when sailing off the west coast of Europe, how far around the world it was to uh, That dates back to, his estimate dates back to uh, observations compiled by uh, the Greek geographer Ptolemy back around 150 AD. And Ptolemy compiled a list of locations of the world cities. The latitude of the cities on his list were pretty accurate. But the longitude, well, we really don't know. We still don't understand what he was doing. <laughs> Some people say that his longitudes were off, that he thought that Europe and Asia were much wider than they really are. And if that were the case, then it would make sense that Columbus thought that the remainder of the world was much smaller. And so he thought it was only about 60 degrees of longitude between Western Europe and Japan, when in fact it's more like 180 degrees. But the truth is we don't really know what Ptolemy did because his work does not survive uh, in its original form. Everything we know is from later scholars. There's some really odd things about what we have from Ptolemy um, that's, coming out, that's come out in recent years. These two maps show uh, an analysis from 2009 of the errors in Ptolemy's coordinates. And you can see the top map shows the errors in latitude, errors of half a degree, one degree, throughout the southern uh, European Mediterranean region. The bottom map shows the errors of longitude. What's weird is how regular those errors are. Uh, what we learn in statistics is that when things are regular, they're not really errors. They're some sort of systematic effect. Um, and it seems that, and when we put these on a line, we look, put Ptolemy's longitude against the actual longitude of the cities on his list, we get almost a perfect line. Meaning that if you knew Ptolemy's longitude and you knew the equation of this line, you could deduce the actual longitude pretty exactly. So we're not really sure what's going on here. Um, but the suspicion is that maybe Ptolemy wasn't really recording longitude so much as distances. And he had very accurate distances east to west. But then the problem was translating those distances into longitudes. Now, whatever the case, people didn't have an idea of how big the world was by the time Columbus sailed. Um, but my favorite longitude story um, comes from uh, a little bit later. And it comes from the travels uh, of a Frenchman named René Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle. We'll just call him La Salle. He was a French Canadian explorer. Uh, and the joke is that in America, we know all the French Canadian explorers La Salle, um, uh, Cadillac, uh, I want to say Pontiac, but he was Indian, right? But we know all the French explorers as names of cars. So we'll refer to La Salle, the name of a car. Uh, but he was one of the first um, 
explorers to go into the Upper Great Lakes region. Uh, he started off in Montreal uh, and he got some, some money, somebody to finance him to expeditions in the Upper Great Lakes. He found the Ohio River. Uh, he traveled in much of the area of central Illinois. There's forts that he established along the Illinois River, including one right outside of Peoria. And he established good relations with the Indians. And through all of this, he had a dream of establishing a connection with, between French Canada and the Gulf of Mexico. Because he heard that there was a great river that connected, that ran all the way down from the Great Lakes to the Gulf. And he spent many years and several expeditions searching out that river. And eventually he found it, and he sailed down with a party of men to the mouth of the Mississippi. And he was ecstatic. And he went back up the Mississippi River, back to Montreal, petitioned the governor there, didn't get what he wanted, ended up traveling all the way back to France and petitioning the king of France. I've discovered a new land for you. The king of France was King Louis, so we called it Louisiana. And he acquired funds and men to establish a colony uh, at the mouth of the Mississippi River. The first colony in the newly proclaimed region of Louisiana. Um, to start the colony, he didn't follow the same land route that he had followed before because that was much too difficult. Uh, he obtained some ships, sailed down the east coast around Florida, and then he started traveling west looking for the mouth of the Great River that he had found from the other direction. And here's where the problem of longitude comes in because he didn't know how far west he needed to travel. He missed the mouth of the Mississippi. He ended up landing somewhere in eastern Texas. He thought, oh, I probably haven't gone too far. So he set up camp, and he sent some of his men on an expedition to find the Mississippi. They came back, they couldn't find it. So he went himself, he led a group of men, said, I know it's here somewhere, it's not very far. He, he had a feeling he had overshot his mark, so at least he went the right direction, he went east. Um, he got as far as the outskirts of modern Houston, Texas, a place called Navasota, before his men got fed up and murdered. And that is the story of La Salle. And there is still a sat statue in Navasota today um, commemorating his expedition. Of course, uh, Louisiana did end up being settled by the French, and it's a big part of American history. But La Salle was murdered at the age of 43, I believe, and he never uh, was able to see what came of his explorations. So, it was very inconvenient not to know your longitude. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you the tale of John Harrison. Uh, and this tale has become fairly well known on the account of a, of a book, a wonderful book, um, by Davis O'Bell, um, who in the late 90s, um, Expose the world to the story of this hitherto unknown figure, John Harrison, a humble clockmaker um, in England who solved one of the greatest scientific mysteries or problems of his time to be able to find the longitude, specifically to find the longitude at sea. Uh, and the standard story goes something like this Harrison, from humble beginnings, no formal education, uh, manages to perfect the art of clock making. And in doing so, he petitions for the prize 
um, that was going to be awarded to him whoever solved the problem of longitude by sea. Uh, and he petitioned uh, an agency called the Board of Longitude, which was set up to give away 20,000 British pounds to whoever solved this problem. That was a large sum in its day, probably equivalent to about five and a half million dollars in US currency today. And the story is that the Board of Longitude was set against it. They were biased because they were all academic ivory tower astronomers, and they thought that the longitude problem would and should be solved by looking at the stars or by looking at the moon or some astronomical observation. They didn't think it should go to a lowly engineer, a clockmaker. Um, but he persisted and he eventually won his case, but only through intervention of the King of England, who saw how unfair the board was. I think the actual story is a little more complex and more nuanced, and we're going to try to see if we can come ac get across some of that today. And what I found fascinating is how many other threads in the history of science uh, sort of come into play within the story of of longitude. We're going to see that Galileo made an effort at it, that Isaac Newton was involved. Uh, Christian Huygens, if I'm pronouncing that name right, which I know that I'm probably not. <laughs> I actually thought, well, it's a little bit of a side note, but this guy, Christian Huygens, he has such a weirdly spelled name, H-U-I-G-E-N-S. And I was searching the web the other day, trying to figure out if I was pronouncing it. And uh, this professor at Harvard University had found some, um, this Dutch, yes. some Dutchman to pronounce it. And I'm going to do my best pronunciation. Remember the spelling is H-U-Y-G-E-N-S. And if my ears are correct, those Dutchmen were saying, Gergun. So I'm not going to repeat that again, and I'm going to use Hoyden's because I think that's pretty good. <laughs> So we're going to talk about, before we get into Harrison, we'll talk about some of the astronomical methods that were proposed to try to determine your longitude. Uh, we'll look at Harrison and his innovations in uh, clocks and watches. Uh, the term they used was chronometers. And these were clocks specifically designed for keeping time at sea. And then we'll talk about his um, interactions with the Board of Longitude. And uh, I think there's some lessons from this story that apply to the modern era, because you have government giving awards to fund innovative science, and then all the difficulties in actually choosing the winner of those awards are still relevant. Uh, the problem of longitude was a well-known problem throughout the scientific establishment um, for at least a couple hundred years before John Harrison arrived on the scene. Uh, Galileo, when he first developed his telescope, uh, he figured out a way to take some of his observations and use them to determine the longitude. And he did that by looking at the moons of Jupiter. Well, how do you get your longitude from the moons of Jupiter? The connection with all of this is that you know your longitude if you know the time. Because the Earth spins 360 degrees in a day. It's 15 degrees every hour. Um, that's about 60 nautical miles per degree. Um, so I always struggle when I try to get these mathematical concepts out. Uh, I'll let you guys do the math in terms of converting seconds and minutes to miles. But it can be done. In fact, I think half a degree is equivalent to about 30 nautical miles. Um, 
if you know that you are three hours from Greenwich, England, then you know that you're 45 degrees from Greenwich, England. So that's the equation of time that links longitude with time. In other words, if you see the sun highest in the sky at a particular time, and you know that when you make that observation, it's three hours later when the same observation was made in Greenwich, England. You know that three hours has passed, and therefore you know that you're 45 degrees west of Greenwich, England. So everything was about time. But how do you keep the time? Uh, there were no accurate enough clocks in the time of Galileo to allow you to keep your longitude. There were primitive clocks, but they would lose or gain several minutes every day. And several minutes of time every day builds up. Galileo's idea was to use the heavens as a clock. To find something in the sky that didn't follow that circle that every star follows. Right? That happened essentially instantaneously, and that could be observed in different locations. And if you could make an observation of some celestial event, and then compare that with the local noon, the time when the sun is highest in the sky, and do that in two locations, then you could tell your difference in longitude. If the same event happens at solar noon in Greenwich, England, but it happens at local 3 p.m. somewhere else, then you know that somewhere else is three um, hours or 45 degrees west. Galileo found his celestial clock in the moons of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter has four moons, and they orbit fairly regularly. At any given point in time, you can observe the position of those moons with respect uh, to the central planet. And most interestingly, uh, about three times a day, one of those moons passes behind the planet, uh, creating an eclipse. And so Galileo proposed to make a table of the times of those eclipses, and using, using that table <coughs> It was a fairly complicated method, but it worked pretty well. And over the years, it was perfected and was actually used to determine longitude in various places on land. But the problem was, how do you make those observations on a rocking ship in the middle of the ocean? Uh, well, Galileo was undaunted. He, he devised a means to do that. He, invented, he developed something he called the celetone, the helmet. And it looks something like what you see here, a helmet with an eyepiece. And the other eye, you locate Jupiter, and with the eyepiece, you can see the moons through a telescope. And in order to make this work on a rocking ship, he developed a, basically a bathtub sitting inside another bathtub. Um, with oil as a lubrication between to eliminate the rocking motion of the ship. And he actually built this, and he tried it out on a ship um, out off the coast of Medici, and uh, got it to sort of work. He never could quite convince people that the that an observer could overcome the motions of the rocking ship. On land, it could work. Although he did note that if your heart beat too hard, you might lose the sight. But on a ship, it was a little bit too much. He petitioned the king of Spain, tried to get a contract with the king of Spain, to give him money to make this work so that Spain could use the knowledge, use the ability to find their longitude. Um, to improve their, their dominance of the seas. But uh, King Philip, well, he thought about it some, but he decided not to go for it. 
Galileo's method did work, though. If you could stay still enough to sight the moons of Jupiter, and over time, tables uh, telling you exactly when each of those eclipses was going to occur were developed. And they were used by uh, Jean Picard and Philip de la Hire and, and later the Cassini family in France to vastly improve the land-based surveying of that country. Uh, this map right here, um, this was presented to the King of France in 1679. Um, and what it shows is it shows the old map and where the coastline of France was on the old map. And then a new map of the coastline that was built from observations made using Galileo's method. Unfortunately, this, uh, the new surveys showed that the Kingdom of France was substantially smaller than everybody thought. <laughs> and uh, so the king uh, is purported to have uh, jokingly said, I'm losing more territory to my astronomers than I am to my enemies. <laughs> but the King of France did approve of all this accurate surveying. In fact, um, he approved the building of, a, of an observatory in Paris for the purpose of helping the surveyors, and the Cassini family in particular, improve their surveying methods. The second method that was proposed to overcome the difficulty of trying to find the moons of Jupiter through a telescope on a moving ship um, was to use the moon, the Earth's moon. Because the Earth's moon is a little bigger in the sky, a little easier to find. And the Earth's moon moves through the sky, through the field of stars, um, about half a degree every hour. Every hour, if you look carefully, if you look at where the moon is in relation to the stars around it, and you come back an hour later, it will appear to have moved a distance equivalent to its own diameter. And so the idea was that the moon could serve us. That if we measure where the moon is with relation to the stars, or during the day where the moon is with relation to the sun, but that's going to change over time. And again, if we develop accurate enough tables to predict where the moon would be in the future, then we compare our observations of the moon with our tables to deduce our time. Once you have your time, you have your lunch. Uh, so this idea was first proposed in the 16th century. Uh, it was first proposed by Johann Warner. It was made popular in a, a book called Cosmographia by Sebastian Munster. But there were a number of problems or obstacles. One is to compare the moon to the locations of the stars, you need to know, to know where the stars were. And up until that point, there was no good catalog of the stars. So this actually set in motion uh, efforts by astronomers to catalog the stars. Um, but even with the stars catalog, second problem is that the moon's path through the stars turned out to be much more complicated than anybody had expected. Um, and that's something that we're going to talk about in just a bit. Uh, but first, another story on the perils of not knowing your longitude. Uh, this story comes from 1707, and it's of historical importance. Uh, it's called the Scilly Islands uh, Naval Disaster. Uh, there was a fleet of ships led by um, Admiral with the distinctive name of Sir Cloudusly Shovel. <laughs> Gotta love those words. 
Sir Claudius Lee Shovel was sent to the Mediterranean and southern France to wage war on the French in the War of the Spanish Succession, and I'm not very good at my history, so I hope I'm getting this right. And on his way back, it was stormy, it was foggy. He didn't know exactly where he was. But he sighted land, and he thought that the land that he sighted was um, Brittany. It was this peninsula right here. And as soon as he crossed it, he then proceeded to make a right turn, thinking that he was going into the English Channel. In fact, the land he saw was the southwestern um, uh, end of Britain. And he sailed right into a group of small, low-lying islands called the Scilly Islands. Um, his entire fleet was lost. Some, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 men were drowned in the sea. Uh, the islands are close enough to the coast that the wreckage all washed ashore. So this was very well known, very well documented. The news spread throughout England very quickly. Um, and this became a rallying cry. Uh, because the English said, we can't be losing our men because we don't know where we are. We have to find a solution to this problem of longitude. And so the British established a prize. Uh, Parliament passed the Longitude Act of 1714, awarding a sum of up to 20,000 pounds uh, to any such person or persons who shall discover a proper method of finding the longitude, uh, as soon as such method shall have been tried and found practicable and useful at sea. And we're going to come back to this practicable and useful a little bit later. Those words have significance. Uh, but another clause in this act was specifying how you would actually achieve the goals and prove that you had a way of finding longitude. And that part of the act stipulated that whatever method was devised had to be put to a test on a trial, on a voyage from England to the West Indies. And 20,000 pounds would be awarded if on that trial um, longitude was determined accurately to within half a degree. Uh, half a degree is about 30 miles. Uh, half a degree, now I remember, is equivalent to two minutes of time. So if you were going to solve this with a clock, you had to have a clock that would keep time to an accuracy of within two minutes on a ship sailing from England to the West Indies, so for a period of one and a half or two months. <coughs> That was a pretty tall order, because at the time, the best clocks lost somewhere between 15 and 30 seconds every day. And that was on land. That was without the rocking motion of the ship. That was without the great changes of temperature and humidity that you find when you're going from one place to the other in the ocean. Most people didn't think that the solution was going to come from a clock. They thought it was going to come from a star. And prominently um, among the people who thought that the solution was going to come from astronomy uh, was Sir Isaac Newton. He was a big proponent of the lunar method. Uh, and he was also an advisor uh, to the parliament in constructing this act. He said, specifically, nothing but astronomy is sufficient for this purpose, he said. You can make the best clock in the world, but that will only allow you to keep the longitude if you already have it. What if the clock breaks down? You'll never be able to recover. The idea of a clock that was so accurate and so reliable that it would be your only source of determining longitude was just unthinkable. 
But at the same time, he was trying to struggle with the lunar method and trying to figure out the motion of the moon that would allow you to dub out the tables predicting where the moon would be at a given point in time, that would allow you to make the observations that would allow you to determine your longitude. And the greatest mind, greatest scientific mind of the day, he couldn't figure it out. This is a this became known as what's called the, the three body problem in physics and gravitational physics, trying to figure out the motion of three objects within a gravitational system because the moon's motion is affected by both the Earth and the Sun. And I don't know the equations, but I know that they were too difficult for Isaac Newton to solve. In fact, uh, one of his um, understudies uh, is uh, purported to say that his Isaac Newton's head never ate but with his study in the room. It was the most difficult thing that he tried and he, he failed. He couldn't he never figure it out. So now enter on the scene our humble putt. Uh, John Harrison uh, he was born in a small town in mid-northern England. He spent his childhood in a, in a village called Barrow-upon-Humber. He is the most famous, the only famous person ever to come out of the village. It was that small. Uh, his father was a carpenter. And John followed his father's footsteps and he learned carpentry. But at the time, people were starting to build clocks. Clocks were starting to be accurate enough that people wanted them. Again, they were still losing 15 or 30 seconds a day, but you rewind them, you reset them. That's still good enough that they're starting to be useful. And so he started, he went into clock making. And he went in at an early age, and at least when he was a teenager, he started building clocks, which made for kind of an odd combination a carpenter building clocks. And so his first clocks were actually made out of wood. Here's a picture of the first big commission he got. This was after he had already built some, sort of as a hobby, and shown his metal as a clock. Um, this was a clock built for uh, a turret, a Bro the Brocklesby Park turret clock. And the amazing thing is this, this is almost entirely built out of wood. And that's something that he innovated and it's something that he kept with him as he built better clocks later on. Uh, the particular wood that he used uh, is uh, a tree called Lignum Vitae, or Vitae. It comes from South America and Central America. It's the hardest densest wood on earth. Um, people still uh, value this wood. It's used to create bearings within hydroelectric plants because nothing else will withstand all the water and all the forces. Um, it's, it's very durable and it also is self um, lubricated. It never dries out. And that turned out to be very important. Um, because one of the problems with making a clock and keeping it accurate was not the clock, but the oil that was used to lubricate the various parts of the clock um, would eventually wear out. It would get old. Uh, and especially at sea with all the salt water, that lubricating oil was a big problem. He solved that by using wood from lignum vitae that didn't need lubrication. Just one of many innovations that he developed. He was a very clever man. He was a tinkerer. He was constantly taking his clocks and making them a little better. Um, Rupert Gould, who later dissected his clocks in the early 20th century, um, said the difficulty with working with his clocks is that he, he was so stubborn. He never, 
He never built a clock and then said, oh, that doesn't work, and threw it away and built another one. Instead, he built a clock and he said, oh, that's not quite right. And so then he added something to it to fix the existing problems. So his clocks ended up being these amalgams of adjustment after adjustment after addition. And every one designed to overcome some problem and to make the watch or the clock more accurate. <clears throat> Um, sometime after 1714, he decided, John Harrison decided he's going to go after this longitude phase. So he started thinking of the problems of keeping time, making a clock accuracy. And so, to talk about some of his innovations, his innovations, there were so many. We're, we're never going to talk about all of them, but just to get a sense of some of the things he did. Uh, the first problem that you probably think of when you think of making a clock work at sea is all the rocking. And that was especially important because the best clocks of that era were pendulum clocks. So a pendulum, the, the motion of the pendulum is of course very important. How do you get that motion to be on a rocking ship. Uh, well, some people thought of putting the clock on gimbals, kind of like that oil bath we saw with Galileo. Uh, Harrison came up with another idea. What he did is he put together two pendulums. And he linked them with springs in such a manner that any external force applied to one of the pendulums would be translated into exactly the opposite force from the other pendulum, and so they would balance out. Very, very pleasant. He also developed a method, a pendulum that wouldn't suffer from the expansion and contraction of metal as the temperature rose and fell. He developed a gridiron pendulum where he used two different metals and he put them together in such a way that their expansions canceled each other out. Uh, he perfected the um, cycloidal cheek. And those are these little things here. And you have to imagine the pendulum hanging down here and swinging back and forth. And a pendulum, in theory, will keep perfect time if its arc is very small. But as the pendulum's arc starts to swing wider, the time starts to not be perfect. Well, he compensated for that by making the suspension mechanism so that the pendulum, instead of swinging in a perfect circle, would swing in a slightly different arc. And he perfected it and he fine-tuned it so that even if the arc expanded beyond the degree to which uh, perfect time was achieved, time would still be kept. A lot of fine-tuning. Every one of these required experiment after experiment fine-tuning, making sure that everything was exactly the same. Uh, he developed something called the grasshopper escapement. I'll see if um, this link will work so we can see how it works. And this is something that translates the motion of the, the swinging pendulum to the clock gears. And it's hard to tell just from this picture, but you can see just how lightly uh, those little levers fall. Uh, he developed that mechanism, which was a brand new mechanism, just to keep the clock, keep the escapement from hitting those gears too hard. Because he noticed that with other clocks, over time, the action, the force against the gears eventually put the clock out of sync. So the clock could be perfect for a little while, but he wasn't interested in just a little while. He wanted to make sure the clock would last and continue to keep time.
So we put all this together, and in 1730, he hopped on down to London with his brand new clock and with a lot of confidence, and he met with the director of the Board of Longitude, Edmund Haley, famous for Haley's Comet, uh, and he said, I've got a way to solve this problem. And Edmund Haley said, I know nothing about clocks. And this was uh, to be a theme in John Harrison's interaction with the Board of Longitude. But Haley did introduce Harrison to one of the premier clock makers of the day, George Graham, who encouraged him to continue. He was obviously impressed with Harrison's work. Uh, and eventually, I'm going to come back to that, Harrison put together his first clock called H1. Um, this was set on a trial from London to Lisbon and found to be very accurate. But Harrison didn't get the Longitude Prize just yet because the Longitude Act says the trial had to be from England to the West Indies. So I'm going to shorten this up a bit in the interest of time. Um, Harrison developed additional clocks, and I just realized I mislabeled these. This should be H2 and H3. He built H2 in 1739, just a few years later. Between 1739 and 757, Harrison entered this period of probably self-doubt just wasn't coming. And he spent 18 years to build, and I apologize again for the miscorrect labeling, H3. But then something happened. And I'm going to skip that story. And in just two years, he built his crowning achievement. It's called Harrison number 4, or H4. And this is to scale with the other clocks. Sometime around between 1757 and 1759, he threw all of his blueprints to the wind. That grasshopper escapement, the uh, gridiron pendulum, he said, I don't need any of that. I think I can do this, and I think I can do it instead of in a clock that's three feet tall in pocket watch. And he built this pocket watch, it's actually about four inches wide and tall, but it was called a pocket watch. And to this day, we still don't understand the inner workings of that pocket watch. How he was able to make it so accurate, how he was able to make the leap from these large-scale pendulum clocks to a pocket watch. But he did The trial at sea, he was first sent on a ship to Jamaica, where the clock, again, kept nearly perfect time, seemed to clearly meet the demands of the Longitude Board, went back to England, and the Longitude Board said, yeah, but we're not really sure of the longitude of Jamaica, so we can't give you the price. And there's some other things as well. He also assumed a going rate, a certain rate that the clock was fast every day that he sort of took out of the calculations. And he said, you didn't tell us that beforehand. How do we know you just didn't make that number up? So he said, OK, I'll do it again. This time I'll tell you the going rate before I leave. And he was given a passage on a ship to Barbados. And again, the clock, the watch performed well, got him to under half a degree, and he got back to England. And at that point, it seemed clear to him that he had won the prize. And this is where the story gets interesting. 
because the Board of Longitude now started to throw at him some caveats. And they looked back to the original Longitude of Act of 1714. <coughs> Remember, this is 45 years earlier that this was written. And they keyed in on the words practicable and useful. They said, we'll give you half of the prize because clearly your method worked and it was useful. But we're not going to give you the other half until you produce two more copies of your clock because frankly, we have no idea how you did it. So how is it practicable? How can I make a copy for another ship if I just have one watch? Well, I can solve a longitude problem on one ship. That wasn't the idea of the prize. Uh, the popular view today is that the longitude board was out of balance. That they put stipulation upon stipulation upon John Harrison. And he was an old man by this point, And it was very hard for him to deal with. He eventually appealed to the king, by the way. And the king convinced Parliament to, to pass another act to grant him the rest of the prize. But in the meantime, he was working to try to fulfill the demands of the Longitude Board, and he was very much aggravated by the process. Um, but this does pose a lot of interesting questions about intellectual property, about what it means to solve a problem about what is the role in government in proponing a scientific solution. Um, because when the Longitude Act was initially created in 1714, everybody thought that the solution was going to be in the stars, in the moon. And that's not copyrightable, so there was no issue. But at the end, it ended up being solved by a clock, by a machine. And so all the issues of patents and copyrights and intellectual property I'm running out of time, so I think I'm going to uh, leave it there. I do want to note, a lot of what we know about the clock comes from one man named Rupert Gould, who spent 15 years of his life uh, in the early 1900s restoring um, Harrison's clocks piece by piece. It's a very meticulous task, and we owe a huge amount of things to him. The clocks are still on display in the Royal uh, Astronomy museum in Greenwich, England. Um, I haven't been there, but I've heard from some people who've been there. It's a fascinating display. And so I'm going to uh, leave it there, and maybe we have time for some questions. I know there's some other talk coming up. I have 20 questions. 20 questions, OK. <laughs> but I leave the floor for anybody who has any other questions. I make other clocks, like his pocket watch? Like, were they ever able to duplicate it? Uh, yeah, so he, um, uh, he got a guy named Kendall to work with him. And Kendall ended up making the, a couple repli uh, replications, and then from there it kind of just grew a lot of yeah. so it was Before that, it was just one at a time. And it took a year or two years just to build one clock. So he just didn't think about writing a set when he Oh, he was terrible. He tried, but he was a terrible writer. He was a great tinker, a great craftsman, but a terrible writer. Nobody could understand what he wrote. Just curious, how could they use technology to do the gears and the other stuff that they did this thing? I mean, it's very accurate in seeing them. That's a great question, I, I honestly think. It's don't. amazing. And yeah. it's 1,800 or something? It is. It is. And I think each gear, I mean, that was a job. Go and create me this gear, and somebody would work very hard to make that perfect gear. I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. It's good to have the microphone with you, right? Uh, how, what is the history of the maps? I mean, the maps were, to me, kind of so accurate at that old time. I mean, Italy and Spain and this. How could they come up with this without... Uh, That's a great question. Well, if you look at the maps be before this time period, you had accurate maps on land, on Europe. But none of the maps that required distances across an ocean and that. So they could keep the longitude on land, but they couldn't keep it on board the ship. Before Columbus, there were maps that showed these pieces of land 
and uh, what is is it that Columbus said that he would go and find land while the Mediterranean area at least was known before in hundreds of years. Yeah. So people know that they can sail without seeing land and they would land somewhere. Yeah, well most of the time though, before Columbus, they they kept sight of the land. Some of the early maps are called Portolan charts. They have like straight lines going from say Tripoli to Rome. And in those cases, they would use a compass to follow the direction exactly when they got out of sight of land. But they never went really far from land. Well, well, generally, they can see the land they go. Like exactly. exactly. So that's why Columbus was so dare. He dared to get out of sight of land. Any other questions? Well, I think you know his name, you know his email, and uh, email me, email Dr. Uh, Daniels. And would you please join with me thanking him for...